in. Um, thank you for joining the event. Um, I do want to let you know that the event is being recorded today. Um, my name is Daniela Antonellis. I'm the founder and executive director of Kindling, which is a new nonprofit organization dedicated to improving fire safety in humanitarian and development contexts. I'll be moderating today's discussion, um, and this event is co-hosted by Kindling and the Global Shelter Cluster Construction Standards Working Group, uh, and is also supported by FCDO, USA, BHA, and the Global Shelter Cluster. I'd first like to thank my organizers and my co-organizers for their collaboration, not only in designing this event, but more generally, as we work together to develop and promote good practices to reduce deaths, injuries, and losses from fire in humanitarian contexts through interagency and intercluster coordination. And you'll see on the screen, we have Phil Deloy, humanitarian advisor to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the UK, Liz Palmer, Save the Children Global Construction Lead, and Jim Kennedy, who is an independent consultant and on the board of directors of Kindling. Before jumping into the panel discussion today, I'd like to also briefly introduce the fire problem and share some information about fire safety research projects kicking off. While there are no global statistics for fires in humanitarian settings that we can quickly reference, informal settlements and the settlements of displaced communities are particularly susceptible to fires due to the combustible nature of commonly used shelter materials, the methods and fuels used for cooking, heating, and lighting, the densely built nature of many of the sites and many other factors. Small fires can quickly evolve into large conflagrations, causing significant losses of life, livelihoods and property, as well as injuries and subsequent exacerbation of the extant vulnerabilities of affected populations. 12 days ago, a fire broke out at the Sharia camp in Duhok, Iraq, which houses displaced Yazidis. The fire destroyed 290 tents, displaced 130 families and injured 35 people. But the consequences of fire go far beyond the obvious physical damage. A Yazidi woman affected by this fire said, and I quote, today was worse than the 3rd of August, 2014, when ISIS attacked us. Fires like these frequently harm displaced persons and undermine humanitarian assistance, but most don't make international headlines. Some of the better known fires from the past year are shown here on the screen. You may be aware of some. Ultimately though, improving fire safety is a matter of protection and accountability to affected populations. But fire safety often falls through the cracks of the cluster approach. Fire is a cross-cutting issue that is everyone's problem and therefore no one's responsibility. It is rarely referenced meaningfully. There is a lack of data illustrating the scale of this risk and a lack of ownership by any global cluster sector and agency. Coordination between agencies, clusters, affected communities, and local governments is urgently needed to develop an effective approach. To support future coordination efforts and fire risk reduction programming, we are carrying out a baseline review on the current state of fire safety in humanitarian shelter and settlements. This project is generally funded by the Global Shelter Cluster USA BHA grant with co-funding from FCDO. Kindling is leading the project with the Global Shelter Cluster Construction Standards Working Group. We aim to engage with practitioners and researchers to better understand past and current fire safety knowledge and practices, and to learn from context-specific fire safety programming, which many of our panelists have been involved in. We aim to bring people and knowledge together and to identify opportunities to drive systemic fire risk reduction into humanitarian shelter and settlements and other humanitarian sectors. We hope you'll get involved beyond this event. Um, please fill out our survey. You can see the QR code on the bottom right hand of your screen um, to share your insights and to register your interest in the project. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, panelists, if you could turn on your cameras um, so that you're able to see, and people are able to see you throughout the panel discussion. Um, I'm going to go through and just read out the bios of our panelists. We have a really wonderful panel. We're really lucky to have these panelists with us today. Um, so first I'd like to introduce Mazen Yashwe, who is a mechanical engineer, as well as a paramedic and search and rescue volunteer at the Lebanese Red Cross. He has eight years experience working as a humanitarian and he is currently a shelter and wash technical advisor at Save the Children International. Previously, Mazen headed programs and operations with the Lebanese Red Cross disaster management sector. 
He was the operational commander for the Quab LES refugee campfire in 2016, the Arsenal armed conflict in 2017, the Ross Baalbek floods in 2018, and the 2020 Beroost blast operation. Next, we have Laura Hurst, who is a PhD researcher at the Global Development Institute, at the University of Manchester, working in collaboration with Operation Florian. Her research investigates vulnerability to fire risk in low-income settlements in Nairobi, Kenya, using qualitative methods to understand how everyday urban fire risk is created, experienced, and responded to by different stakeholders. As well as her research in Kenya, Laura was a key member of the Operation Florian team, which carried out a fire risk reduction assessment of Syrian populations for Save the Children Lebanon, and supports further research on gender and learning around fire risk response in resource poor urban settings. Um, please wave as you're going around so everyone can see you. Um, thanks. Uh, next, we have Steve Jordan. Steve is currently a group manager and head of prevention for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Services. Alongside his 22 years of active service, he has been involved in fire and rescue humanitarian projects for 18 years. In particular, over the past seven years, he has worked in a variety of countries and with INGOs undertaking fire risk reduction assessments in refugee camps and informal settlements such as Kenya, Lebanon, Thailand, and South Sudan. We, we hope Steve can stay on the whole time. He's actually on call at the fire services very right now. Um, if you are not a speaker, can you please mute yourself as well? Thank you very much. Um, we also have Professor Richard Walls, who is the head of the Fire Engineering Research Unit at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. His team has been involved in a wide variety of work related to informal settlement fire safety, including full-scale testing, detection systems, evaluating suppression systems, and developing guidelines. They are actively developing fire engineering education in Africa through postgraduate teaching, courses, and degrees. Next, we have Paul Chamberlain, who has over 15 years emergency response experience. This includes de delivering commercial training and large-scale incident management. He has been involved in maritime and land-based search and rescue for the past five years, applied, and for the past five years, he's applied his expertise to the humanitarian sector. His focus is on operationalizing response solutions in complex settings, and Paul is currently based in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. David Rush, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and has been working on understanding how fires spread in informal settlements focusing on Cape Town through the Iris Fire Project and Nairobi through the Tomorrow Cities Project. Through experiments, modeling, surveys, and geospatial analyses, David and his team are identifying where fire risks are higher within settlements, so solutions can be co-produced with communities. This work has led him to be invited to speak at the Institute of Fire Engineers Centenary Conference and the GFDRR Understanding Risk Forum, and he now sits in the ISO Working Group for Large Outdoor Fires to ensure informal settlement fires are not overlooked. So thank you so much to all the panelists for your participation in today's event. I'm really excited to get into the discussion. Um, and today we're going to frame our panel discussion around fire response and preparedness. But first I wanna ask, what do we mean by fire response or response in general? Um, I think this word can sometimes cause confusion when considering fire safety in humanitarian context because response can actually refer to many different things. From a disaster management perspective, response offer ref often refers to the immediate hours and days after an acute incident. In the humanitarian sector, response refers to the duration of humanitarian assistance, which often lasts years. The average length of humanitarian crises is now over nine years. But in contrast, fire response is the time during an actual fire, from ignition to extinguishment of the fire. It refers to how people and systems respond to a fire and its evolving nature. And while most fires start small they're, and grow large, there, there really is an opportunity during a fire to respond quickly and efficiently to be able to limit its growth and its ultimate consequences. So today our discussion is about fire response and the actions that can be taken before an incident to strengthen the responses, i.e. preparedness. So without further ado, we'll jump into questions. Um, we're going to we have some pre kind of written questions that we'll ask and then later we'll open it up to the audience to ask questions. So please, if you're in the audience and you want to ask anything, just drop it into the chat and then we'll pick it up in the Q&A part of the discussion. Um, so the first question I'm going to direct towards you, Dave. 
Um, in simple terms, can you please describe a fire in an informal settlement or camp and please focus more on the behavior side of the fire rather than the people at this stage? Okay, so yeah, thank you very much there, uh, Danielle. Um, I'll try and be brief. So I think everyone knows about the fire triangle. We've got fuel, we've got oxygen, and we've got heat. Obviously, in all circumstances and situations, we're going to have fuel and oxygen. They're going to be there. And then we have this heat, which is going to be a thing that initiates the fire. So that's our ignition. We've got a heat source. That could be electrical, that could be a candle being knocked over. You know all of this. Then obviously that ignition starts to grow um, within a compartment, usually within kind of your, your, your shelter. And within that space, it's got two ways of going. It can either kind of grow slowly, consume some of the fuel and then die out naturally or be put out. Or it can grow quite quickly and exponentially to a point where we have something called flashover happening. When we have flashover happening, then that's when we get these fire spread uh, situations occurring, where we have one shelter spreading a fire to another shelter. And that happens through the openings and depending on the materials that we have of the shelter, um, it will, it will, those distances between these different shelters and different areas and where those openings are will really impact how quickly that fire spreads. Hopefully that's, that's answered that question. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, that's great. Um, and in general, I'm going to ask questions to one person, but other panelists, please raise a hand or just jump in if you want to add anything um, to the discussion. Hopefully we can have a conversation. So thank you, Dave. Um, the next question, I'm going to push towards Mazen first, um, but others, please jump in after. So what types of behaviors, activities might you expect during a fire in a settlement? So human behaviors, um, what kind of activities would you see? Sure, Daniel. So as David said, whenever uh, there would be a fire, the first thing that people would uh, would need to do is to evacuate and run away. But before that, and especially in vulnerable communities, what they try to do, and especially in a refugee complex, is to collect their paper and belongings. And this is one of the things that delays their uh, evacuation and uh, leaving the, the refugee camp. Uh, other than that, one of the hard things to do is to evacuate because as we all know that uh, refugee context, like refugees usually live, or like live in, a, in an overcrowded area where the, uh, the emergency exits or leaving uh, the specific area would be uh, not easy. And they live in a, in a close community. So everyone knows everyone and they, they do care for, for each other. So their main uh, priority first is to evacuate and second is to ensure that they have their uh, belonging or at least uh, the essential things, uh, their papers, because that would be very complicated in their context to uh, like get back these uh, these papers. Thank you, Mazen. I'm also wondering, Paul, if you have anything to add from your recent observations in Cox's Bazaar around kind of activities and behaviors and fires there. So I, I think what what we noticed in the, the big fire that happened in Cox's Bazaar on, in August was the the need the, the speed at which the fire spread, which which David has already touched on. Um, given the fact that the shelters here are um, are entirely combustible, so the the walls, the roof, everything. So that the speed at what we saw, we didn't experience a flashover situation because that the shelter itself just ignited completely. Um, that led to um, to panic um, and, and the speed of, of, of the moving fire. So it, it was just, um, you know, to follow up on that, it, it was just, in effect, blind panic, just get out of the way of the fire. Thank you for sharing that. And the next question I'd like to direct towards Laura. Um, and also others, please jump in too. How, can you describe how people's diverse abilities and vulnerabilities may shape their experience of the fire, both during the incident and perhaps afterwards as well? I think you're on mute, Laura. Sorry. Um, so yeah, there are lots of different ways in which um, people's vulnerabilities but also capacities kind of shape how they respond to a fire and um, so just a few of the key ones so obviously things like um people's age and um, 
and and issues related to disabilities can impact on people's mobility in terms of evacuation um, and particularly older and younger people. Um, in terms of gender, we've been looking at how um, different gender roles sort of also uh, impact people's experiences. Um, there's quite there's some data which shows that um, women and girls and and children are more at risk of um, burns in a lot of contexts due to the fact that they're more likely to be in and around the home. Mm -hmm. um, but also in terms of how they might respond to a fire. So, for example, some of our research in Lebanon showed that women and girls were either sort of actively excluded from education around fire awareness and response because it was seen as a um, a male activity, um, or were only given information um, in education around um, particular parts of, sort of, of fire awareness and safety. Um, so trying to understand or develop gender responsive fire safety education is, is really important um, and taking into account really the specific sort of local and cultural context um, with regards to gender. Um, and during a fire, um, gender sort of also comes into play when um, uh, where we've seen that it's often men who respond to fire um, once it's been ignited and there's a spread. Um, and so in, in that case, that men can often be at, at great risk of, of burns and injury um, during trying to put out mm. a fire. Um, and I think one of the other important things to acknowledge is that People living in settlements come from a range of contexts um, and have a lot of skills, experiences and um, professions from previous lives elsewhere to draw on. Um, and I think that's also important to kind of try and build into um, planning and um, around around fire safety. Um, but also, the, the, yeah, I just wanted to make another key point that often uh, people living in settlements have repeated experiences of, of fire and so over time um, communities may build up their own um, informal approaches to fire safety and uh, particular households or, or families or residents will sort of have particular roles to take on or a, a, um, you know, local plans may develop to be developed too. So um, I think that's also a really important uh, issue to recognise as well. Thank you. And Mazan, I saw that you had your hand up as well. Yes, thank you, Laura. So I, I totally agree with what Laura said. So the the response to the fire and the culture or the, the communities that we are responding to in Lebanon as a host community or uh, refugees, it is more of a manly activity to respond to the fire itself. But I remember very well out of the experience of the disaster risk reduction at the Lebanese Red Cross is that the uh, everything related to the preparedness or ensuring that the family has an evacuation or an emergency evacuation plan, women are were more in charge and involved in uh, collecting the things or ensuring that their belongings or the important things are, for example, elevated or in a specific uh, room where they can collect them and uh, like run away before panicking. So that was, I remember very well that was, that, that was an activity uh, assigned for, uh, for women mainly. So mm -hmm. thank you, Laura, for that. Thank you. Um, and Richard, I think you had similar observations in your recent work looking at a fire in Cape Town as well. Is that right? Yeah, it, it really depends Yeah, from fire to fire. But yes, often the, the, the uh, women and children will evacuate out first and then the men will move up and down. In, in terms of fire behavior, in, in, I mean, human response in the formal settlements, you see a lot of chaotic movement and also a lot of repeated movement up and down to fetch stuff, come back, fetch stuff, come back. So it leads to a whole bunch of confusion now when the fire department arrives and they're trying to get in and there's movement and then where there used to be a road, now suddenly all people's belongings have been packed there, so suddenly there's no longer a road, there's beds and chairs and couches. So it makes a very confusing situation and often the level of assistance for the from the community, I'm talking specifically informal settlement, makes a huge difference in return in terms of response efforts. Where there have been communities where they said, okay, Mr. Firefighters, Mr. Firefighters, here you go, 
we will show you the way, we'll help you clear the way, and we'll take you there, versus you arrived late, we're going to throw bricks at you, and everything in between um, has has a very large influence on the number of dwellings um, that are, are affected in an incident. Thanks, and we've already begun to touch on these, but I'd like to um, ask you, Steve, what are the kind of primary challenges with fire response and humanitarian settlements like overall? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a good question. There's a, uh, there's a lot of um, issues in terms of primary response. I mean, ultimately, one of the big <laughs> big extinguishing mediums used for fires is water. So often the challenge is not necessarily sometimes where the water is. It's actually sometimes how do you get the water from the source to the fire. So. Uh, that sometimes will often involve either some sort of mechanical uh, requirements such as a pump um, or you're looking at potentially buckets of water and depending on the setting or whatever there may not be those types of containers to be able to carry water and that in itself takes time. Um, other factors are in terms of primary response is, is, is awareness and training for, uh, for people that, that, that live within the, the camp setting. Um, I have tended to find, that depending on the setting, certainly in South Sudan, it was quite interesting that there were people that kind of worked with fire. Uh, they were uh, agricultural workers, they used fire, so they understood the risks and dangers and how it sort of like moved with, um, with the climate and the wind, but that's not necessarily the case. So uh, again, location, geography, they all, these all create different situations in terms of that impact and that primary response, as well as again, the type of materials that are burning. So again, in Thailand, for example, uh, one of the materials that was used on the roof was a, a, an oil teak leaf. So uh, it was used as a as a as a roof a form of roofing because of its its waterproofing qualities. The problem was was when it dried, it was very um, uh, very brittle. So when it got caught in fire, it would get caught in the convective heat and actually then jump onto other shelters. And cause further widespread. So, in terms of that pr primary response, that lack of awareness and education for the responders can be a very, very critical factor. If you can have that kind of like that, that level of, of knowledge and awareness, even at that sort of basic level, with some of the simple stuff such as pumps and the, the capacity for water, then you've got some sort of effective response that could be put together. Mm. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. And following on to that, Steve, I'm wondering if you could also explain. Who are the stakeholders that are involved in fire response and what are their respective roles? Well, it's like you said at the start of the, uh, uh, the presentation, uh, Danielle, the, the, my personal experiences are there is no primary, uh, uh, there's no primary uh, uh, stakeholder. And, and often you'll tend to find, certainly from my own personal experiences, that as much as fire, is a uh, seen as an important issue, especially when a major incident occurs. When it actually comes down to who bears that responsibility, a lot of people will actually pass that responsibility on. But what they don't understand sometimes is that actually they're part of the puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle. And if they come together, um, they can actually fulfil that whole that whole uh, response or that whole responsibility. So what I mean, for example, is is wash. Um, you know, I've had personal exam uh, uh, situations where I've been in a camp speaking to a wash technician and they've laid a water hydrant, uh, sorry, they've laid a water system, but they turn it off at six o'clock at night because they don't want people to steal water, which I can understand because water is a precious resource. But when you ask them very simply, could you put a hydrant system in that could be effective after six o'clock, their instant response is, yeah, of course we can do that. So you tend to find that being able to communicate with all the key groups and bring people together is 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 a uh, is, is essential. So everybody is a stakeholder, but who is the key responsible individual? My personal view would be it lies within the camp management or shelter um, in terms of that responsibility. But uh, like I said, everybody lays a st lays a some sort of stake and claim to this. Thank you. Does any other panelists want to add to this about the primary challenges and the roles of different actors during the incident? Amazon? Yes, Daniel, I would like to add another thing as, as Steve 
sad in the case of Lebanon, for example, the old tires, so the, the, the community and the refugees have tendency to install old tires on the roof of their tents, uh, thinking that it would help them from like losing their roof during uh, heavy winds. And in that case, during summer, it's a, it's a big issue for them to have tires on the, in case of fire, because that will even accelerate and making it, it uh, worse. So what we're trying to do is to ensure integration of uh, uh, some activities during the shelter intervention. So any, any shelter intervention, for example, for the uh, for save the children in a household would, uh, would consider placing these tires by sandbags, for example, because that would uh, help uh, securing their, their roofs and ensuring that wouldn't uh, accelerate the fires. Over to you. Thank you. And Paul, I can see your hand is raised as well. Yeah, just really to follow up on what Steve was saying in that you know, everybody should be taking responsibility, but nobody does. And I think we should also remember the, um, you know, the, the actors that host us. So the governments that, who, you know, the countries where, where we all operate. So certainly here in, in Bangladesh, it's, it's a pretty complicated picture um, negotiating between the, the line ministry responsible for the refugee camps and the fire service civil defense who legally in the eyes of, of the law have privacy at a fire and but also the armed police who provide security for the camps um, as well as the NGOs and the UN agencies all of whom um, are involved and have a stake in this. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And I'm going to come right back to you again with another question. Um, so what might a coordinated fire response look like in a humanitarian settlement? Um, so so I'd like to say a miracle. Um, I, I think, you know, the experience I've had is that the plan needs to be in place to begin with. And that plan needs to be simple and people need to buy into that plan. I think one of the problems that, that we try to do is we try to overcomplicate um, plans. We try to um, make things far more complicated than they actually need to be. Um, we need to remember that the people we are working with, um, this is in the case of the camps here in Bangladesh, the, the, the safety volunteers who are the primary responders to to fires in the camp, they, they have other roles as well. As well. So it, it needs to be um, simplified and it needs also to be empowering because the, the camp residents need to take the responsibility. They need to be empowered at the first level. Um, without, you know, fires can quite easily break out at two, three, four o'clock in the morning where there, there is no site management staff, there is no organization that they can turn to for support. So they need to be trained and empowered to, to deliver a basic level response. There need to be a chain of command, there needs to be a clear incident command system. Um, and that needs to be as, as as possible, I think. Thank you, Paul. Um, and next, let's go to Dave. So, Dave, what can be done before an incident to prepare for future fires and to prevent them as well? Wow, you gave me the easy question. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot that that can be done um, from you know household level up to up to the camp level, as we've been hearing bits and pieces of uh, during this conversation. Um, and I think it, it is having that kind of coordinated response because you don't want someone doing one thing in their home, which then increases the risk for those around them. So everything from you know changing how fuel is used and stored within the home to try and make it a little bit safer, all the way through to actually how we're planning and arranging the dwellings and set like the shelters within the camps uh, on a global kind of arboreal level is really important. And you know, there are ways and means that you can place certain 
structures, which are kind of coordinated structures within the, the humanitarian response with those domestic shelters. So, for instance, you know, if you've got a more robust set of toilet blocks, you can use those as a potential fire break between the more flammable tented shelters. And so it's, a, it's about kind of understanding the fire science that drives these fires from being quite small individual homes into larger uh, conflagrations. If you can understand that science a bit more, then actually we can start helping the impl implementation of, of interventions at both the, the small scale all the way up to the, to the higher scale in terms of the preparation um, for these things. And lastly, I think, you know, fires are, are one of these things that you're never going to be able to take out of the situation. So it's about having that coordinated response, both within the local communities, within the, the settlements, but also within the, the management structures within the settlements, so that the rapid changes uh, and rapidly evolving situations can be dealt with. And I think the, the last thing I want to say on this is that when, which is something that, that Mazin uh, touched on in, in Lebanon, was we, when you do the interventions, it can't be straight after the event. You don't want to kind of go, oh, a fire's happened, let's make changes to the settlement right now, because actually the horse has bolted and the immediate need of those who are affected isn't fire safety. It's getting a shelter back over their head. So there needs to be long-term planning and long-term interaction with communities to actually affect these changes. Thank you, David. Um, the next question, I think, is a pretty big question. Oh, Mazen, please jump in. Please jump in. <laughs> yes, I would like to add one thing on the what can be done before an incident to prepare for future fires, or in terms of, of preparedness, because that was one of the, I believe, the most successful uh, stories and intervention that has been done with uh, Operation Florian and Steve and the team, which is the fire breaker uh, solution. I'm not sure if it's a common thing uh, worldwide or not, but in Lebanon, I can tell that it was one of the successful uh, preparedness. It consists of uh, rock wool, rock wool material. The secret consists of a rock wool material, uh, a sort of a wool that is built between uh, tents. I believe the, the operation from your team can, can explain more about that, but it proved a uh, success in the past uh, experience. I'm, I'm very happy to share with you, Danielle, the, the result and the report that was generated. And as Sigma Children was still implementing this, we had a success story in one of the camps where a fire took place and because of, uh, because of the fire breaker, uh, that had to first uh, delay the fire and in some place to, to stop the fire uh, from expanding. So this is a very good intervention that is, in my opinion, much more uh, effective than the distribution of fire extinguisher and other uh, things, because in some place, the vulnerable communities have tendency, and I'm being and speaking very bluntly and honestly, they have tendency to sell the fire extinguisher. Like if, if someone is hungry, he would sell the fire extinguisher to eat. But the firebreaker is a different uh, is a different intervention, and uh, it showed like success. Over to you. Daniel, I think you're muted. Thank you, <laughs> um, Steve. I was just saying, I see your hand up. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, I, I think it's, it's it's adding on to uh, um, to Dave and, and Mazen really, which is in, in terms of what what can we do to prepare. And I think there's another factor here, which is obviously depending on the environment and and the setting and the, and and the country in which we're talking about. It is actually about engaging with those local services uh, as well, those responders, those uh, civil society groups. Uh, and what I mean uh, by that is, you know, every country has a fire service. I, I grant you that certainly in many of the refugee camps that w or informal settlements we know about will be in low to middle income countries. So on the basis of my own personal experience, I can tell you they won't particularly be very well facilitated as fire services. However, there is something to be said about that investment within that civil society itself and what the benefits can bring in that. So about engaging with those those local fire services. So again, a good example was in Lebanon, 
you know, with the, the vast array of different uh, informal settlements, which were which were everywhere. There was a P code system uh, created for each of the camps. Now, when the fire service used to turn out, they were told about a fire in a camp, but they had no clue as to where they were going. All they were doing was actually looking on the horizon to try to understand where the smokestack was. So just that simple involvement of giving them the P codes and giving them a map had the vital uh, improvement of time and seconds equally as well. Again, you know, my own personal experiences, I have to say that one of the most effective uh, uh, NGOs or civil society groups is the Red Cross. You know, they have a lot of uh, volunteers, a lot of responders, and the early engagement with them as well in terms of what safety, what fire elements can be put within that camp in terms of preparatory work is, is absolutely uh, valuable. You know, as Paul said, the, the reality is, is we need to prevent, we need to build uh, structures to reduce or, or mitigate, but fires will happen. So who is it that's around you that you can instantly seek support from and how can you support them as well? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, and Laura, I see your hand is up as well. You want to add anything? Um, yeah, I was just going to echo Steve's point about um, making sure to include and engage with local fire services, um, often weirdly neglected as a key stakeholder. Um, but also just in terms of kind of looking at the broader issue and, and talking about sort of what can we do before fires actually happen. Um, and I think one of the main, whilst I think fire quite rightly sort of sits within the shelter sector and, and is often that's where the sort of um, responsibility lies. Um, I think there needs to be um, uh, much more kind of a mainstreaming of fire risk across the other humanitarian sectors. So, I mean, fire is a shelter issue, but it's, you know, it's a water and sanitation issue. Um, it's an education issue, gender issue. It's, you know, it's a health issue. It's a livelihoods issue. Um, and and all those sectors and, and many more should, um, you know, should be playing a key part in sort of, you know, contributing to a a more joined up, holistic, cohesive approach to fire, so that um, you know it's it causes of ignition and um, can be tackled, and um, you know people's awareness and response to fire, how they understand fire, what resources are available on the ground when a fire does happen, and um, how the other key thing is recovery, and you know how people, what people need to recover um, and you know, to stop additional fires happening again. Um, so yeah, a much more mainstreamed approach which takes into account sort of the whole process, so those root causes and um, through to impacts um, and also draws on expertise from outside the humanitarian sector. So, you know, for example, um, through the work of, of Dave and Richard and, um, and you know, fire science, um, but also from other um, disciplines such as you know community education and um, disaster risk reduction and um, engineering etc. Thank you Laura and Paul I see your hand up as well as, is up as well sorry. Yeah, so I'd, I'd just like to kind of add to Steve's point really about other stakeholders and certainly one of the things that that we found recently is um, we found it much more powerful to uh, capacity build the residents um, of, of the settlements than we have to invest um, the same amount of time and effort into um, NGO staff. Um, there's, a real, there's a real will from a lot of NGO staff that they want to be um, the kind of emergency responders that charge a but certainly our experience is that they have so many other things um, that they need to do um, this and, and the, the need to respond to a fire is generally pretty infrequent but unless they are specifically focused on some sort of emergency response the skill fade is pretty rapid and pretty dramatic um, in capacity building the the residents of the camp uh, what we found is they have a vested interest in maintaining their skills because ultimately it's it's their homes, it's their shelters that are that are being protected. So um, we we've, we've developed a, a a model that we used for uh, flood response within the refugee camps of Bangladesh that has been 
expanded out to the host community as well. And, and certainly, given how successful that model has been, that's the model that we will roll out for, for any sort of uh, firework that, that we deliver here. Thank you, Paul. And I'm just scanning through the the chat, which is a really active yeah. chat, which is amazing um, to see if there are questions. But it looks like questions are being answered by our panelists in real time on the chat. So thank you, panelists, for doing double tasking so efficiently. I did see a question in here about the link between fire and the environment. I'm wondering if any of the panelists want to share um, some thoughts around, I suppose from two angles, thinking about both how fire impacts the environment in a negative way, but also perhaps how we could integrate fire safety and environmental interventions together to try to make positive change. Any hands? I'll just pick someone if no one <laughs> puts their hand up. No. Dave, Sorry, I can, think, can you oh, say that question again, please, Danielle? Yeah, I'm just asking about the linkage between fire and the environment. So thinking about the negative impacts fire has on the environment, but also just thinking out loud, perhaps how fire safety could be integrated into environment um, focused interventions, like greening type of interventions. Richard, I see your hand is up. Just comment, I mean, as a commenting from a South African perspective, I think one of the issues with fire has been pointed out by all the panelists is it overlaps with everything and inherently addressing one aspect of the environment has not gone effect as been commented on in the chat when there's better refuse rubbish removal you re reduce the fire load and it helps a lot and so all of the sectors play a part i mean water supply water and sanitation as soon as there's a better water supply to the area there are more standpipes or um, tanks or whatever it is there's better water supply to be able to fight the fire uh, as soon as there is better infrastructure, better roads, better access ways kept clear, it it um, you know, stops the fire from spreading when there's sort of a fuel break. So inherently, I think that's one of the issues is that we sometimes we in this room look as fires as, well, as, as an object in isolation where it's just totally coupled on the back of pretty much everything else. And unfortunately, that's one of the biggest challenges because we have to get everyone around the table. I know off post fire, South Africa, you need your electricity suppliers around the table, your transportation, your city management, your layout, your engine. <laughs> so it becomes an extremely difficult thing to, to um, coordinate. But even sometimes it gives us opportunities when we partner with un, sort of unlikely partners, for instance, social workers. Social workers are the ones who are normally working in the homes with the highest risks. So typically, where there's alcohol abuse or whatever else, often fire risk is coupled with those homes. So we can even partner with people like that to say, all right, let's get some smoke alarms or some other devices into those homes. Let's identify the key role players. Let's get them the governance. Um, you know, while we're doing an electricity or roads upgrade, let's make fire part of that conversation. So, you know, just some, some general thoughts of the very interwoven nature of the problem. Thank you. And Steve, would you like to add to that as well? Yeah, um, I think I can add on a little bit to what to what Richard's saying as well, possibly being more specific, which is in terms of, you know, combining the two questions of fire, you know, uh, in, in environment and safety interventions. I mean, the reality is, is one of the biggest sources or causes of fire is down to cooking. So and one of the, the large used sources of cooking in, in many camps is wood. So and so depending on the size of the camp and the duration of the camp, you will find some sort of environmental degradation as people go to out source out fuel uh, without outside of the boundaries of the camp, whether they're creating charcoal or whatever. There are associated health issues as well in terms of respiratory diseases as well. So sometimes it's about trying to find a, a solution for a more effective way that people can use fuel sources, whether that's still using some form of charcoal, but in a more efficient way, so there's less demand on it, or trying to find uh, other fuel sources. Now, I know, for example, in Lebanon, they have gas. Um, you know, in Thailand, they were using charcoal bricks. So if, if there are viable alternatives, which are cost effective and sustainable, that's the thing it's also meeting the needs of the community and understanding that 
you know, the, the behaviour sets of the community match that solution. Um, and, you know, and I've seen various different projects where unfortunately the, the concept of the project and the pilot of the project is fantastic. But the, the gap that's missing is that continuation of that project, that 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 uh, that 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 idea and then the community will go naturally steer back to what is most effective and locally sourced. So uh, if, if if you can solve the cooking, you're taking away not wholly, but one of the key uh, ignition sources within that camp. And also, you know, you're reducing that environmental degradation, which has impacts on the, you know, the community that have pre-existed there. But also uh, there's also the reduction, depending on the environment, of, of things like gender based violence as well, because Tragically, many w w women who go outside of the camp are also very exposed to uh, different forms of violence. Thank you, Steve. Um, we are at the end of the session, so I'm going to maybe stand for two more minutes. We'll see a couple other hands. We'll just try to squeeze in a couple more uh, insights. Uh, I think we could spend hours talking about this, and we probably should as a group. Um, but Laura, I see your hand is up if you want to add anything around the environment question. No, it was that was a mistake in hands up. Sorry. Oh, um, I'm just replying on the chat to somebody. So yeah, no problem. Paul, do you want to add anything? I see your hand is up. Yeah, we we've seen a shift in Bangladesh away from wood for reasons to LPG. But what we've also seen now is um, the LPG stoves were distributed as a one-off distribution item, and this has happened two years ago. Clearly, there's there's degradation within within the hose that is uh, attached to the regulator and the burner, um, and we are certainly seeing an increase in fires associated with LPG. Um, I, I, I'm looking into this, and I need to do a little more work on it. But my my assumption is this is due to um, potentially the um, the hoses leaking LPG, creating a gas rich environment, um, LPG being heavier than air sinks. Most of these stoves are placed on the floor. So as soon as the, the householder then ignites the stove, that ignites the gas rich environment and, um, and, and the fire starts. And, and very quickly, um, the shelter is engulfed in a fireball. Given most of these stoves then have wooden uh, or bamboo shelves above them, there is a source of uh, of fuel, and and very quickly, um, you know, the fire takes hold and and spreads. Thank you, Paul. And um, so we're going to bring the session to a close. I'm really I'm really amazed at how quickly the discussion went already. So thank you so much to all the panelists and for the audience for joining um, and engaging in the chat. Um, we do hope that you continue to engage around fire safety. As you can hear from the discussion, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of research needed, a lot of work to understand the local challenges in different contexts and how people experience fire differently and understanding local capacities and capabilities to improve fire safety. Um, and certainly a need for coordination within the shelter sector, um, as well as with other clusters. So hopefully this is the beginning of a much, much larger conversation about fire safety as part of this project that we're, we're uh, trying to work on. I have the survey here on the, on the um, presentation again, so please do go and fill out that survey to share your experience um, and to register your interest. Um, we will be trying to learn from the panelists' previous work and others uh, who have been pushing boundaries in fire safety. So again, thank you all so much. I hope you have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Um, and yes, yeah, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next Thanks. session of the GSC meeting, open space session on diaspora engagement starts in 10 minutes. So forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.